entusiasmo.
you. We have now one of our quartets that's going to entertain you for a few minutes. How about a welcome addition for the welcome addition?
And this is what one of the things we really worked for this year. So I'd like for some of the girls, if you'll bring up the check, we'd like to present to the Tidelanders a donation to help them go to Seattle and bring home that trophy. <laughs> Right. 
tonight, as you've already witnessed, but we have a very unique opportunity for you. You have the opportunity to take home with you this very night much of the very music that you're hearing right here. How about that? It's on a, on a record album. Got a nice picture of the Tide Landers on the front. You get that free. The record album costs $7. And the, and the funds generated from the sale of these record albums go to defray some of our costs to go to Seattle. Let me tell you, you take 105 guys to Seattle, Washington, you spend a bunch of bucks. Even plumbers don't make that much. <laughs> but we kind of got it figured out now. We talked amongst ourselves before we came in here. We figured if every one of you buy 10 of those records, <laughs> That'll go a long way towards our trip to Seattle. So we do want to uh, we don't do want to encourage you to take take part in that. Uh, I've done an awful lot of uh, MCs with the Time Landers, and I enjoy it so much. I really do. The the, the way and the, the the things that I've said to introduce this next song, I've received a lot of compliments from a lot of you folks for, and I appreciate those very much. But I say to you only, it's so easy when it's the truth and when you really feel it. Maybe I'm old-fashioned. Maybe I'm living in the past. But over 30 years ago, when I fell in love and married my beautiful wife at age 18, somehow I knew that my first love would be my last.
men who fought bloody and memorable wars. None quite so bloody or quite so memorable as our own brave American Civil War. This was the war that pitted the industry of the North against the plantations of the South. But out of that terrible conflict, it grew strong and mighty, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Could be the prince. 
on a barbershop show without a few songs about Dixie. <laughs> I give the word.
I was appointed as, as motivational chairman for the Tidelanders. And this meant that I would get up and kind of give little pep talks and little motivational talks. And we made, we made banners and we made fake trophies and we did all kinds of things to adjust the attitude of the Tidelanders into a winning attitude. And in fact, I was recently referred to by one of the quartets in the Tidelanders affectionately, I hope, as the Norman Vincent Peel of Barbershop Harmony. <laughs> I took that as a pretty high compliment. I thought, you know, that ain't bad company to keep. But you know, we did all this kind of thing and we went to San Francisco and we didn't win. And we went to Philadelphia and we didn't win. We went to Salt Lake City and we didn't win. And we went to Detroit and we didn't win. And we said, why are we not winning these contests? And all of a sudden it came to me. In fact, when I started preparing my motivational messages for the Tidelanders this year, it became really quite difficult to figure out just what to say and, and, and how to put it. And all of a sudden it hit me like a ton of bricks. Why it's so hard to come up with these things? Because this time our attitude is good. Our self-image is healthy. We've got everybody here working like crazy for this thing. And we're all doing the right things. And you see, too many times in the past, we had too many Tidelanders that said, I'll oh, believe it when I see it. <laughs> well, we found out that don't win. You're never going to win when you say that. And so now I'm proud to report to you tonight that there's not a single Tidelander up here that uses that phrase anymore. Every Tidelander now says, I'll see it because I believe it. That's what we're going to do. I want to, I want to draw just a little bit, borrow or steal, whatever you want to say, a little story from Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. Dr. Peale tells about a young man he knows in New York City, 16 years of age. Now, this wasn't an ordinary 16-year-old boy. This kid was aggressive. He had a lot going for him. He had something between his two ears. Dr. Peel says he's going to be somebody someday. This young man went to his father. And one summer, at the beginning of the summer, he said, Dad, he says, I don't want to sponge off of you all summer. He says, I want to earn my own money. I want to get a job. His daddy said, son, he said, that's very commendable. But he says, you know there's no jobs for 16-year-olds in New York City this summer. He said, there's no jobs for anybody in New York summer, City this summer. He says, you couldn't get a job for anything. He said, I'm sorry to tell it to you, but that's the way it is. The boy said, Dad, he said, I don't believe that. He said, I'll learn somewhere along the way. Then if you have a deep desire, and if you become a positive thinker, that out there, out there somewhere is a satisfaction to that desire. He said, I believe there's a job here, and I'm going to find it. So he looked in the newspaper in the one ads to see if he could find a job. And he knew there'd be an ad in the paper, and there was. And the ad said, show up at a certain address on 42nd Street at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Be prompt. Was he down there at 8 o'clock the next morning? No. Was he there at 5 minutes to 8 the next morning? No. He was there at a quarter to 8, 7.45, only to find 12 other boys in line ahead of him. He looked at the 12 boys and he had to admit that they were all good-looking boys, all capable of doing the job, and he had to admit to himself that if he were the boss, he'd hire any one of the 12. But he didn't want any one of the 12 to get the job. He wanted the job. He was a competitor under the American free enterprise system. So Dr. Peel said, what did you do? He says, I went into the most painful process known to man, I thought. <laughs> and if you can become an unemotional, positive thinker, when you think, you'll always come up with a solution to the problem. And he did. He took out a piece of paper and a pencil and he scribbled a note on it. Walked up to the secretary of the man during the hiring, bowed respectfully to her, handed her the note, and said, Miss, it is absolutely urgent that your boss get this message immediately. Now, had he been an ordinary boy, she would have said, forget it, Sonny, get back in the 13th position in line, wait you hear from me. But intuitively, she knew this was no ordinary boy. She took the note, she opened it, she read it, she smiled. She walked in, she handed it to the boss, he opened it, he read it, and he laughed out loud, for this is what the note said. I'm the 13th kid in line. Don't do anything until you see me. <laughs> and that, is the message that all these Tidelanders have for the judges in Seattle. Well, the 13th 
received a gift of any kind from Dick Sheba. <laughs> you know, though, they're very careful. <laughs> this is to John and the Tides on the right track to bring home the gold. Good luck from Judy and shut up Sheba. <laughs> What do you do with it? Blow it, blow it, blow it, blow it. Really? <laughs> Keep the whole world singing. Oh, yeah. 